Hi, everyone. Good morning. If you could all take your seats in the room, that'd be fantastic, and settle down. Um, my name is Henry Foy. I'm the uh, European diplomatic correspondent at the Financial Times, uh, based in Brussels, formerly in Moscow. And um, I'm your moderator this morning for this panel on the Russia challenge, which is both an impossibly large task uh, to moderate because there's just so much to say, but we're hopefully going to pack in as much as we can in the next 90 minutes. Um, it is so nice to see so many of you here this morning in person. I was a little bit worried that we would struggle to fill the room at 9 a.m. on a Sunday after a second night on the town for most of you. Um, and I don't even have to tell the panel, don't worry, loads of people are back home watching on the live stream in bed. You've got a massive audience, don't worry. Um, uh, I wanted to start by congratulating the organizers of this forum for both an insanely well-timed and well-located event. Um, since, since I agreed to moderate this panel, uh, the Russia challenge has shifted dramatically. Since I started thinking about the questions on Monday, it's shifted. And since most of us arrived here in Helsinki on Friday, it's, it's shifted again. Um, this is a very live issue, and I would, of course, argue it's the most important issue that all of us will discuss here this weekend. Um, I'm incredibly lucky to have a fantastic panel uh, of, of speakers here, and hopefully I'll be doing as little speaking as possible. These are all people that I read uh, uh, every day um, to find out what I should be saying, and I'm sure a lot of you in the room do too. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce them, though. Um, we'll start at the far end. Um, Mike Kaufman is the director of the Center for Naval Analysis in their Ru Russia Studies program. He's also got like seven other titles. He's a nightmare to quote in the FT because it takes up a whole paragraph writing all the things he does. But most of you will know him because he's probably the most famous of the, of the new uh, military uh, Twitter uh, experts. Uh, any of you that use that infernal platform will see him all the time correcting uh, uh, keyboard warriors into what actually is a tank and what actually is an APC. Um, next to him is Kadri Leek. Uh, she's the senior policy, policy fellow at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Um, um, a long-term friend of the FT, someone who has been uh, really influential in shaping how we see Russia and, and Europe. Um, Arkady Mosh is, is the program director here at the FIIA, uh, a long-time um, and an excellent Russia analyst here. And, and last but very much not least, Kachi Punoniemi, uh, who's the Mannerheim Chair of the Russia Security Studies at the University of Helsinki and the Finnish National Defense University. Same title at two places, very cool. Um, Kadri drew the short straw uh, and is going to take my first question, which is to unpack in five to seven minutes what the Russia challenge is right now. And I believe has been doing some really interesting research in, in the last months and weeks on, on, on how Europeans see that question. So, Kadri, if you could. Oh. <clears throat> on, um, yes, good morning, everyone, and very happy to be in, in, in Helsinki. And yeah, I um, volunteered to share some um, information from my recent research, as that really is sort of one concrete bit of knowledge I can offer. Uh, everything else would be speculations. Um, but at ECFR, we, we do things that we call power audit, which essentially means that we go to all European member states and ask what they think about question X, Y, or Z. And over the summer, I sent out questionnaires about Russia and European policy towards Russia. I tried to see how much unanimity or, or difference there is in European views, uh, because the conventional wisdom in many places, including Moscow, but, but also in some corners of Europe, suggests that Europe is so disunited that it will soon uh, fall apart under the weight of sanctions, I don't think that is going to happen. I mean, it was quite striking what we got back. Uh, I asked about sanctions. Um, a small proportion of countries suggested that we should uh, beef up the sanctions. Big majority said that sanctions are sustainable and they work. We should stick to them. Hungary said we don't like sanctions, drop them. No one else. And there is no talk about whether the sanctions work. I mean, a number of countries admit that Putin has gone beyond where he could be influenced by economic calculations. But mm. that's not an argument for dropping sanctions. It's about something else now. And everyone knows it. So I don't think that we will be having those discussions we had between 2014 and 22. Do sanctions work? Should we drop? How, how shall I go about it? 
that's, that's a thing of, of, of the past. Outlook in Europe is gloomy. Mm. Everyone is quite melancholic about where this is going. People predict long war. People predict a completely different world order after that. We don't know what it will look like, but we asked, do you honestly think that the OSC-based European order can be restored? Um, some said yes, but the majority answer is that we stick to that in our rhetoric, but deep down we know that the world has changed and the future will be different from, from the past. But despite that melancholy, there is a certain decisiveness to address the challenges there are to yeah, muddle through that winter and muddle through the times to come. There is no defeatism at, at all. And, and that, was, that was quite striking. Mm. Interesting thing to me also was that I think Russians are seeing it. Some better Russian commentators whom I, I'm reading, Fyodor Lukyanov recently wrote a column where he basically said that Russia has started a standoff with a most better equipped and mobilized part of the world that is using it to launch its own project. According to him, Europe had stagnated, but now they are using that really adverse situation to, to give a new mental start to, to the European project. And I think there is something in it, because Europe was a bit stuck in that doc, um, framework that we adhered to, but couldn't defend. The OSC-based order, right for all countries to choose their own alliances. I mean, you know the sort of framework we were operating in. Mm. And that was a credo, but wasn't something we could really um, practically defend. So now that has been smashed to pieces, which is sad. But on re species, it looks to me that people are actually focusing on getting things done, maybe eventually building something new. So. I, I don't think that Europe should really give us um, cause for desperation. Worry, yes. Lots of work, absolutely. But, but no gloom and doom. Mm. Well, that's a nice way to start. Um, Arkady, uh, what Arkady said there, I mean, there's obviously a big difference between 2014 and 2022. How much of the Russia challenge that we face now is sort of of our own making? I mean, how much has the Western view on Russia have had to shift and catch up with reality uh, between 2014 and 2022? I mean, has the perception of the challenge changed? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Henry. And yes, uh, short answer is yes. Uh, I think in the last 20 years, compared to the last 20 years, the West now has the best chance to actually successfully meet the Russian challenge. Why? I come from a medical family. I was taught from the beginning that before you start treatment, you need to understand the diagnosis. Mm. And we now understand the diagnosis. The diagnosis is this, this, that this, the essence of the Russian-Western relations at the moment is conflict. Not everybody is ready to call it like that. Some play with it's not a military conflict, it's a different type of conflict, maybe it's not a conflict at all, but implicitly people realize it's a conflict. Mm. It's not sanctions and dialogue. It's not interdependence. It's not strategic partnership, for God, God forbid. <laughs> it's a conflict. <laughs> and that means you need to prevail. The definitions of what you mean by prevailing might differ, and it still needs to be discussed, but the, the, the basic understanding is there. What has changed in the Western perceptions and understandings of Russia and the post-Soviet space, frankly, in the last several months is the following. I will quickly go through five points. There are actually more, but these I find most fundamental. One is the extension of what I've just said. Uh, West is no longer dodging the conflict. It is not seeking the position of a mediator in the Russian and Ukrainian conflict, pretending it's a Russian-Ukrainian rather than the Russian-Western conflict. 
it helps Ukraine. And it knows that it's right to help Ukraine economically, politically, militarily, diplomatically, the way you can. This is a huge change, because if we go back to the times of Crimea annexation, the beginning of the conflict in Donbas, the West pretended it was not part of the battle. Well, they actually pretended or was happy to pretend Russia was not part of the conflict. It's part of the same story. Now it's directly involved, and as Kadri has just said, it understands it needs to keep to be involved. Second, and this is, I think, also fundamental, a preference of a frozen conflict over the hot war has been dropped. First time in the post-Soviet history. Because the default behavior of the West in the previous 30 years was when something was happening, freeze it. Mm. Leave it to the future generations. Now people in the West understand that a frozen conflict is not a solution. It's at best a pause before a new phase of war, which will be worse and more disastrous than the previous one. That's a fundamental change. Three, the mental map that has existed up until recently and which was dividing Europe into the space of Euro-Atlantic integration and the post-Soviet space is being archived. It's not yet fully archived. You can still meet people kind of seeing this division. But nevertheless, the EU decisions taken in June to, to provide candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova are basically killing that old world view. I'm not getting too euphoric. I understand what difficulties are ahead. I know that for many EU countries, <clears throat> the solidarity they expressed in June was the culmination, was the top point. And we need to make sure Ukraine will not follow the never-ending story of the Baltic enlargement. And I mean, I can continue. But nevertheless, compared to the times of, let's say, Dutch referendum on the association agreement, many other kind of things happening in Europe, it's clear that the European countries are willing to really change their views of what used to be their views of the post-Soviet space. The, the post-Soviet space as a recognizable political category is becoming history. Fourth, not everybody, but kind of many have to now admit that Russia is not a hegemon of whatever is left of the post-Soviet space. It's not only that it lost Ukraine, but the fact that none of the post-Soviet countries, including Russia's closest allies, is supporting it openly, tells volumes. I mean, Russia's closest allies, Armenia and Kazakhstan, are not helping Russia to circumvent the sanctions. I mean, there are some individual com com companies that do, but the states do not. They do not rush to recognize the independence of certain areas, or let alone the annexation. The only partial exception is Belarus. Partial because the regime is happy to support the Russia, but not the people. Uh, but even the Belarusian regime, having been, spoke, having been speaking about its readiness to finally recognize Crimea's annexation, actually did not do it. There was a statement by Lukashenko, but the constitutional procedure in Belarus has never been even started, let alone completed. So none of the post-Soviet space is following Russia. And this is, of, this is not totally new, but one could expect that at this critical moment, Russia would be able to press its allies more seriously to no avail. Fifth and finally, and this is the most important probably of all, most controversial also, and believe me as a Russian, I'm very sad saying it. And furthermore, uh, among my friends and colleagues, I'm almost in the minority of one who says that this is the right thing. Most of my colleagues disagree with it, but I agree with it. When, what I'm saying is that when we're having the debate, whether it's Putin's war or Russia's war, or Russian's war, we are at least recognizing that this is Russia's war. This is extremely important because, again, we used to have a picture 
uh, a very simplistic picture that there was a bad thing called Putin's regime and a good thing called Russia and Russian people. Unfortunately, that was too simple and too optimistic. Again, I give, compare it with Belarus. In Belarus, there is Belarusian regime and Belarusian people. And that's why Belarus is not at war. Because the regime would be willing to drag the country into the war, but people don't let it happen. There was a famous Soviet dissident writer, Sergei Davlatov, who once wrote, describing the 30s, that Stalin, of course, is a slaughterer, but somebody wrote these four million denunciations. That's where we are, without the active support of the 25% of the Russian population, without the passive acquiescence of another 50% of the Russian population, which do not support the war, but are happy to express the support when they are asked to express the support. There probably would have been no war. And it's the same story. For as long as they don't protest against the war, they will have war. For as long as, it's the same as like, for as long as they don't want to have elections, they will not have the elections. Mm. This cannot be helped for now, but it needs to be recognized and it's by and large progressively is being recognized that we have a problem not only with Putin. And again, believe me, it's very painful for me to say these things. Mm. To conclude, what is the recipe? The recipe is actually simple. Do not be intimidated and do not be bought. And unfortunately, for many years in the past, many in the West were intimidated by possible Russian steps. And unfortunately, many, and we will not be naming the names now, but we know them, were bought. And were lobbying special interests as if those special interests of theirs would actually be indeed the collective interests of the West. So the program for, the, for now is to prevail in the conflict, relying on these two principles. But of course, in future, the task will be even bigger because what to do to make Russia change, I don't know, but it will have to be done. The change will have to grow from within, of course, how to promote that change. Uh, that will be a very daunting and challenging question for us for many years to come. Thank Thanks, Arkady. Very thorough analysis and lots of um, points I'm sure that your f c panelists here would like to respond on. We're talking about the war a lot, Mike. It would be remiss not to tap your incredible expertise. C could you put this conversation in the context of what's happening on the ground right now? I mean, it's obviously been a very busy weekend. Uh, is the challenge getting harder, given what's happening in the conflict itself, or getting easier? Sure. Um, and thanks for the kind invitation to speak here. So. Uh, I wouldn't actually put it either way as harder or easier. I think where we are currently in the war, and it's often difficult to tell whenever you're observing the conflict, sure. it's obviously much easier to write the history of a war after it's happened. <laughs> but Ukraine at this stage has the momentum and the initiative, and it has considerable advantages. The Russian military is at their most vulnerable heading into the winter, and that represents a strong window of opportunity for Ukraine. Russian lines are thinly manned, the morale is quite low, and there continues to be a fundamental mismatch between Russian political aims and the military means they have available. And as the winter approaches, however, you might see more of a return to strategies of attrition and exhaustion because in the next couple of months, the war might transition to being a focus on force reconstitution. And the question will be for Ukraine to make sure that its military comes out better in terms of quality, equipment, manpower, and ammunition out of the winter into 2023. Russia's partial mobilization, which appears in practice to be a phased general mobilization, at the moment is a very chaotic process. It's about what you would expect. You know, as an old Russian military saying that whoever served in the army doesn't laugh at the circus, and that's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> Russia's probably going to try to use this mobilization to stabilize their current lines heading into the winter and raise manning across existing units, and then eventually maybe even create additional or new maneuver formations. The moment that effort is really born out of desperation from my point of view, and it would have been a much more dangerous development if Russia had gone through with it back in April, when they had allowed the force capacity available, officers, enlisted professionals, and a lot of the equipment. That said, uh, mobilization and wartime measures take the situation a bit into 
I would say, relatively uncharted territory. This really hasn't happened since World War II. It's very much understudied in my field, and I would be a liar if I was to tell you that I know exactly how this is going to unfold. It's an inflection point with a good degree of uncertainty. The main implication of mobilization, at least from a military perspective, is that it may extend the war. It does not necessarily alter the trajectory or the outcome, doesn't improve the quality of Russian forces or change many of the problems that they've had in the military, and it could also very well blow up in Moscow's face, depending on what happens to this army during the winter. That said, it should not be dismissed either. Manpower quantity is not deterministic, but it does matter. Mobilization together with annexation, from my point of view, marks a relative uh, point of no return for the Kremlin. It means that Russia cannot easily revise minimal war aims and that the regime has fully committed itself to the war. That makes it very likely that the war is going to go on as long as Putin's in power, at the very least. And one of the challenges with the conflict is even though right now it's very clear that Ukraine is winning, it's typically up to the loser to decide when the war is over. So from my point of view, that very much means that Europe needs to think about the measures they're going to take to support Ukraine economically, in terms of defense capacity, ammunition, equipment, and what have you, going well into 2023. The question is really about sustainability and long-term sustainability of the effort, uh, and assume that this war might extend into 2023 and beyond. Why? Look, it's fine for people to hope for a faster victory, right? The job of analysts like myself is always to recommend preparing for the worst possible outcomes because wars often tend to go on much longer than policymakers expect, okay? And this is the expectation that I have to try to set. And many also want to imagine a stalemate or a freezing of the conflict, as Arkady mentioned. And I'm going to say that I very much agree an early pause or a ceasefire is only going to result in rearmament and yield a follow-on war as a result of this war. That's the way it's looking like to me. It'll be a temporary respite. Now, maybe lastly, I'll say, because I've heard this discussed several times before now uh, at the forum, I think presently that the risk of nuclear escalation is fairly low. That's kind of the only good news in that department. Uh, I think there are many steps likely between now, where we are now, and a dramatically increased risk of nuclear escalation. But we are overall on an escalatory path. And if you say, what does low mean to somebody like a military analyst? Well, in 61, Khrushchev assumed the risk of nuclear escalation might be around 5%. 5% is considered pretty high and significant in discussing this topic, okay? So for those people who are in the business community for whom 30 or 40, 50% is high, in a conversation on use of nuclear weapons and nuclear escalation, 5% is considered quite high, all right? So mobilization in the near term lowers the risk, from my point of view, of this kind of escalation. But overall, it raises the long-term risk. There's steadily the risk that that is a trajectory that this conflict could, uh, could undertake is growing. Mm. That's, thank you so much. I mean, Katya, you and I have spoken a bit about this in advance. The, going on from what Arkady said about how this is no longer a war uh, against bad Putin, but it's, it's bad Russia. And the, the extension, of course, then Russian people. What Mike's just said there about mobilization, extending this, and, and sort of, if you like, spreading the risk wider. The conversations that are going on now, and, and the president, president and Ninisto mentioned this on Friday, you know, what happens next, right? what happens after, how do we structure that? I mean, this Russia challenge is going to be here for as long as we can imagine, right? How do we, how do we plan for the next thing, the post-war challenge? Is, is it too early to do that? Well, at least it's something that we have to um, think very carefully right now, because mm. the war shapes us, the war shapes Russia. And I think at the start of the war, uh, Russia that we used to know was lost. We kind of realized that uh, we are not dealing with the, anything that we, we, we used to know exactly. And I mean, the, uh, the idea of uh, textbook, in, idea of national in interest, what are Russia's national interest? And, and nothing in this war or starting the war kind of is near this uh, expectation. So how to imagine a future where uh, everything that you thought uh, was make sense even in Russian politics no longer applies. So this war shapes us, it shapes, shapes Russia. But of course, uh, we can um, then con kind of try to uh, look at the situation clearly right now. So what Russia is doing, it's burning bridges, uh, 
Mm. So it uh, concretely and very symbolically. So there's, in a way, nothing from the previous policy to, to take, take with us to the future. Then on the other hand, as I think Arkady well, well described, we have the imperialist, colonialist, Russian core, very old fashioned, maybe in the Russian leadership living in a very different mm. century from where, where we think we are living 20, 21st century and they are somewhere in 18th, 19th century. So we have a Russia that is applying policies going forward with, with very different mindset than, than we are ready to, to understand. And then this gap in a public politics. So I think it's, it's kind of realistic to assume that there's very little with, with what we can do. Even if I say that, well, war shapes Russia, mm. uh, it shapes us. How to, how to then shape Russia to direction that is easier in a way to mm. deal with in the future. I, do, I just don't see any, any way to influence it. So uh, then it means that after, after the, uh, then it might be that the uh, one, one uh, final, final thought is that uh, of course we can think of scenarios. So if Putin can um, hold on this mobilization thing without it kind of becoming a, a something that really uh, turns uh, turns the people against against the Kremlin, maybe we will see a period of kind of totalitarian model, even even fuller version that than there is now. Or then the kind of uh, total love, um, total best predel, so the kind of losing the losing the grip on power, and then with the criminal uh, networks and criminal kind of background that the system has, mm -hmm. uh, it will look very different from from the early 90s. So um, I don't have an answer, so I'm maybe the only one here who doesn't have a, have a clear answer. But I, I think I, my point mainly is that we, we need to start thinking very carefully. Mm. Also this part, not, not just how, the, how to end the war in a way that is uh, good for Ukraine, but also how this war has, will change, change Russia. Kadri, do you see that in your, in your research and, and looking around Europe at the moment? Do you see governments taking that journey, if you like, towards a different Russia strategy? I mean, I, I, I started my career in India, and, and India is a country that has been very open-eyed about its geographical situation and its long-term foreign policy, defense, security challenges on its northern borders. Europe is only really starting to realize, right, that this is a long-term security challenge on its eastern border. I mean, have you seen... Do you think that it's comp that European governments united are taking a clear-eyed view of what that's going to look like for decades, centuries, perhaps? Or are we still being naive about how long this could last? I don't think anyone is, is naive, but it's, um, it's, it's hard to be making plans in, in, in that sense, yeah, I think all these suggestions that we need to discuss our relationship with Russia after the war, mm. um, yeah, uh, there will be Russia after the war and we're going to have a relationship, but I think it is premature to discuss it in any concrete terms because everything or so much will depend on, on the outcome of the war and, and basically and how will we get from from here to there? I mean, but, longer sorry, term... But, but will it depend on the outcome of the war? I mean, however this war lasts, Russia has committed the crimes that it's committed between September, February 24th and now. You can't wish them away just because there's some kind of a peace deal. So how does that... Yeah, work? no, no, no. But and, and, and that's true. And this crime has been committed and that will always be uh, a thing between Russia and the West, unless the regime in Russia really changes and, and regrets. I mean, I've been witnessing intra-Russian discussions about 
what can be done with that. And basically the suggestion that emerges is that someone needs to go like Willy Brandt on, on, on his knees or her in, in, in Kiev. That's, that's, that's the only way. And I think we, we really are that. That is, that is the only way. But I, you know, longer term, I don't see how Russia is winning it. I mean, I just compiled a list of things that, that Russia is losing or that, you know, Russia has shaken up the status quo uh, and created the likelihood that very many components of the former status quo will now change to Russia's disadvantage. I mean, just, I mean, many people have been pointing out that starting from smaller things. Russia is losing even Crimea. When it announced annexation of four other oblasts, then Crimea became equalized with, with Rose. And now Crimea has no that special status it sort of implicitly enjoyed uh, earlier. I mean, Russia is losing the world order it had a claim to. I, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that everything Russia asked for, or many things Russia asked for in December, were actually available by diplomatic means. Mm. I mean, President Biden was ready to discuss world order with Russia in terms that had been refused by the Westerners earlier. This is true, and that was a first. And I think actually Biden was right in, in, in offering that. And he offered to discuss arms control, that was on the table. He didn't offer a Trojan horse in Ukrainian politics or, or Minsk agreement, but even that was not sort of, I mean, Minsk agreement had been signed by Ukrainians and that was also a fact. So by launching that war, I mean, Russia basically made it much harder to gain any offers. And then I'm struck that Russia is so obsessed by sovereignty, by, by being a power to whom no other power can dictate terms. If Russia, when Russia emerges that, from that war, uh, I, I think it will inevitably be much more dependent on China, unless something, unless things turn so that it manages to repair its relations with the West, but that would imply regime change. But otherwise, I mean, China will be the one who fuels Russia's future economic growth. China is already delivering uh, semiconductors to Russia, etc. cetera. So for the whole technological side, Russia will be dependent on China. And I think Russia is also losing bygone worlds, you know, I, wars. I don't think that... I don't think we will be discussing the memory of Second World War the same way we used to before, before that war. I mean, Russia was so obsessed with the narrative of Second World War, being on the right side, etc. I don't think we will, we will be discussing that the same way. Or even Russian literature. I mean, some of my closest friends in different countries are uh, translators. They, they translate Russian literature into Western languages. And they say that, listen, Dostoevsky is great, but I don't think we are going to read him the same way and in same quantities in the future. So, you know, there are all those shifts happening there. And it's just striking to me. Why, why on earth did Russia do that? Mm. All these things it's likely to lose. Uh, the question, of course, is that makes... We need to get from here to there. Uh, and that's, that's without blowing up the world. And, and, and there, is, there is the risk, because some people in, in Russia will also understand that they have lost so much and they have risked so much, so they better somehow try to get some victory out of it. And I think that's where we really... There is a very risky, risky moment ahead, and it is really important that the West navigate them correctly, to the extent you even can define what the correct path is. And, and often you don't, because you just don't have information and so much is depending on stuff, decisions made in a moment uh, mm. in some Kremlin offices. You can't influence everything and you will inevitably need some luck, etc. But, and that will be really, really tough. And that is, of course, where Europe, that sort of, functions clumsily in, 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 you know, EU structures, we are not very well equipped to handle situations like, like Greece. I mean, thankfully, we have United States that have provided quite some leadership. Mm. Uh, until 2024, we probably can rely on that. 
After that, who knows? Mike, I noticed she's smiling there as she said that. Do we still need the US? Do we need them more to confront the Russia challenge as it goes ahead? Or have, has Europe got a bit overconfident in terms of how it can handle this? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, let me make two points first be before I answer that, and they'll be relevant to my answer. So if you kind of look at this war and you ask yourself, all right, what is this major conventional war in Europe? Tell us a little bit about the character of war. And why is that relevant to the answer of to what extent does Europe need the United States in a leading security role? So my views on this have pretty much stayed consistent, which is that beyond the initial operation, beyond the initial phase of war, which is usually high intensity with a lot of maneuver warfare, Conventional wars come down to attrition, the ability to replace manpower, material, and ammunition. And the force that reconstitutes itself better over time can recover from those losses and can mobilize our society and then eventually begin imposing very significant operational dilemmas on our opponent. The second point is that this war also reminds us that scaling force employment is very difficult. It is very difficult to employ a large amount of forces in a coherent manner in one theater of military operations, especially the more complex of an operation you're trying to attempt. And force employment is deterministic of success. Forces on paper don't matter and count that much because forces never march cleanly off of paper onto a battlefield. Why I often say that Excel spreadsheets do not fight, okay? <laughs> All these tabulations you see people do, you know, in the ether of whose military is better and stronger on paper are not that significant. Force employment is king, all right? And what most militaries might be able to do with a couple of battalions or brigades, that's actually about it. For a lot of militaries, that's literally all that they can do. They cannot use force on a larger scale. So uh, where does that take me? Well, this force to me is a leading reminder of why the United States needs to play a leadership and integrating role in European security. I've heard plenty of people in the last seven months say, that poor Russian military performance means that Europe can handle this by itself now. Let me tell you this, this is completely magical thinking, okay? This is a great aspiration. I'm not saying that Europeans should not aspire to this objective, but let me give you one analyst assessment. You are very far from it, all right? Just be very frank. European countries lack all the key enablers from command and control, logistics, intelligence, and do not have the capacity to scale operation. There's no country in Europe that can substitute for the United States in this role. I'm not sure Europeans themselves would be able to agree on which country should be able to substitute for the United States in this role. That's a secondary issue, right? Uh, European militaries, from my point of view, as good as they are, do not add up to a capability to engage in large-scale military operations. They're also, let's be very frank, incredibly brittle when it comes to capability, manpower, and ammunition. If you look at this war, and you look at the casualties on both sides, Russian casualties and Ukrainian casualties, any European army would have been off the field at this level of casualties a very long time ago and would have been completely out of ammunition, okay? I just want to be blunt about this. I know European air forces that are fantastic. They can beat the Russian air force any day of the week, unless it's the eighth day, because they only have seven <laughs> days of air-to-air -air munitions. That's it, all right? That's what they have, okay? This war revealed major deficits in defense industrial capacity across the West, very much including the United States, too, from stockpiles of ammunition to production capacity. And let me be blunt, NATO's expended a lot of its munitions supply in Ukraine, and we're only seven months in. It's going to take years to recapitalize the stocks of NATO. And this war is far from over, potentially, okay? So these are kind of my positive points. I'm trying to be as frank as I can about it. But yeah, this is actually a very strong reminder for many folks why we do need NATO and why I think the United States needs to continue to play a leading role as uh, integrator in, uh, in terms of military operations and planning in Europe. But, but to, to obviously ask the follow-up on that, does that not mean that Putin can sit and look at this and say, do you know what, in terms of the, the threat of the Russia challenge to Europe, it's still very valid because we've exposed that deficiency on the European side. And as Kadri just said, we can rely on the Americans till 2024, potentially. Uh, this is not particularly 100% bad for Russia, what's going on here, right? In terms of exposing those limitations on the European side. No, I, I'll be honest, I think it's pretty bad for Russia. It's about as bad as it could be in terms of strategic... <laughs> of course, of course, <laughs> you know, notwithstanding. You know, as, but, as far as strategic blunders go, I think, I think this will do on, until the next one gets here. But the point, the, the point being is that uh, no, it actually reflected that um, 
even without direct forces present on the battlefield, uh -huh. the United States and Europe together have enough capacity in terms of intelligence, military capability that is willing to provide. They can make a dramatic difference in the war, mm. a war that Russia was rated to win conventionally. Okay? It shows that in, even if you may think of this more as perhaps uh, a proxy war of sorts, right? You can see that for Russia, this actually shows that, well, Russians always knew that they were quantitatively and qualitatively the inferior military relative to NATO. There's never confusion about this on the Russian end, okay? But I think, uh, I suspect that that strategic culture may end up learning quite a bit from mm. the disaster that this war has been about the extent of, of Western military capability, Western resolve. Uh, obviously, we'll take credit, and particularly the United States. Mm. Arkady, I'm, I'm struck by how, you know, this panel seems very focused on the things that Russia's lost and the things that are, that, are, that are going wrong for Russia. You listen to what Putin says, of course, and he thinks completely the opposite. Obviously, he's wrong on, on almost all counts, if not all of them. But how much of that is a big danger, that you have this completely different view of what's happening on one side and on the other? How do we fix there's, that? There's something with, with, the, with the sound. Okay. Can you repeat it again? I'm just saying the gap in reality, that is yeah. this gulf in reality that has emerged between what Moscow sees and thinks and what the West sees and thinks. Is that inherently a problem, or is that something we can just ignore and say, it's fine, Putin's going to come up with all these crazy views, and he's going to say these things that aren't true. Surely at some point it becomes a problem that nobody is explaining to the other side what's really happening. Uh, it is a problem. It is a huge problem. Uh, well, two, point, two kind of reactions here. One is that they do certain analysis, it's not just craziness. I mean, okay, Kadri doesn't believe that Europe will blink at this point, maybe. They don't know it, because Europe did blink many, time, many, many times before. Yeah. I mean, uh, as of a year ago, the argument would be the Europe would still acquiesce to what we are doing, we'll buy them. We're still coming back to Africa. We have positions in Latin America. We have positions in the General Assembly. In, in the, we are a member of P. I I mean, they put up a list of things, including, let's say, the triumph of the will, right? So we can do the decision-making quickly mm -hmm. in, in a coordinated manner. We don't need these democratic little things called debates. I decide and everybody jumps and, and implements what I decide. So there is a certain argumentation why Kremlin thinks it's strong and can make it. And this is, this is a problem. But the other problem, frankly, and I maybe not, I shouldn't be saying that, but I will. Uh, for many years, and that continues, the Western politicians were, were reading Putin's speeches as intended for the domestic consumption. Yeah. Putin's statements were easily dismissed as intended for domestic consumption, still are. This is wrong because he means it. Mm. If you go through, Katri can do it better than I do, than I, but I mean, if you go through his speeches in the last 18 years, at least starting from the Beslan speech, September 2004. But he said clearly that the Islamist terrorism is just an instrument in the hands of those traditional enemies of Russia who want to, to tear juicy morsels from it. 2004. Mm. Then there was a speech about the collapse of the Soviet Union being the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Then there was the Munich speech. And then repetitively, time after time, he was saying, guys, I have a problem with you and I'm going to solve this problem the way I can solve this problem. Mm. No, it's for domestic consumption. We don't need to care mm. because we have interdependence and strategic partnership and partnership for Russian modernization and you name it. <laughs> so, Russia has a problem with, with, it, with itself. The West has a problem with Russia, but the West also has a certain homework to do in terms it reads Russia, because it's so easy to dismiss the things which they really mean just because it makes our life more convenient. That should stop.
Catherine, coming back to your, your earlier point, should, should a Western um, strategic endgame here to be the complete collapse of the Putin regime, the destruction of the regime as we know it, and potentially the Russian state? So should that be our... Yeah. our well, I, I'm entertaining the idea sometimes, theor theoretically, <laughs> like in, in a context of how to, how to make this war uh, finish earlier. Mm -hmm. So trying to maybe, and I think that's part of the plan here, but I think what it is important what Arkari just said and also earlier discussion on does it matter why we, that the Kremlin sees what is this conflict so differently mm. from us and yes, of course, it is a big, big problem here and uh, after reading a lot of, lot of these documents and now recently reading also, not just the media or, or what, what Putin is saying, but also uh, the academic literature, the military uh, literature or the historical lit literature. Uh, it, it is amazing how, how the scholars, in a way, have adopted the Kremlin war rhetoric. And uh, there's very little space there to have a conversation on what, what kind of in what terms Russia could uh, finish the war in, in a way. I, I don't see that kind of discussion. Maybe, maybe my colleagues do see some of it in, in Russia. And that's, that's first a big, big problem. But the bigger problem is the way the Russian leadership went to this war and many other conflicts is the idea that uh, there, is, there are two versions of it. In both versions, Russia is only reacting. Russia is not mm. actively uh, have an active agency in the conflict. So uh, there is this threat of, of uh, Western intentional uh, weakening of, of Russia. And, and now it's getting the extreme version. So even Ukraine is a, this vassal of the West, etc. It doesn't have an agency. Mm. But then there's another version of the same, uh, same issue, which is that uh, Russia is a victim of, of long-term long all kind of thing, things that uh, it, it can't have an agency. Mm. And so there is this um, complete uh, schizophrenic um, starting point when, when Russia is trying to argue what it is doing, mm. which led partly to the uh, failure, early phase of failure in this war, because they, uh, the scale of the military participation, military force and, and the political objectives, mm. there was a disprudence. They, they were not in, in a good scale. So, and that's, that's, when I started, that's a part of the problem we are having now, uh, is that we can't in a way um, have a conversation with the Russia who is not uh, acknowledging that it is actually in a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes ideas of settlement, and I r truly agree with the colleagues here that uh, any keys fire, any kind of a mm. partial thing. Um, would, wouldn't be the right thing to do at the moment, even if it means con continuing of the uh, destruction. I'm keen to get questions from the audience. I see far more um, capable minds than mine uh, out there. But just before I do that, and while we're getting the microphones ready, d d to ask the three of you the same question I just asked Katri, like, sh should we be wishing for the collapse of the Putin regime? Um, is, that, is that going to make the Russia challenge easier for Europe and the West or harder? Mm, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I mean, of course, regime collapse would, would open all sorts of risks. Mm. But will these risks be bigger than the ones we are having now? And at least they would sort of allow whoever takes away in Russia to get out of, mm. of this escalatory spiral that some of them must understand this is disastrous. So I don't think we can do much to bring it about. I think it would be a wrong policy for West to sort of make that our goal policy, try mm. to, that's, that's no. But if it just happens, I mean, yeah, please. Mike? Yeah, I'll comment. So 
Uh, and that actually, often the first question is, it depends on the how it collapses. Sure. It matters quite a bit. Sure. Um, but that being said, yeah, in general, I think there's a mistaken notion that, you know, whatever falls, Putin might be worse. Actually, statistically, in regime transition, it's usually better. You're more likely to get somebody like a Khrushchev following uh, Stalin than you are somebody who's worse. And plus, with Putin, you have... You have a major uh, problem, kind of not to, not to put it glibly, but the old dictator decision-making problem after 22 years and a sure. personal authoritarian regimes. And the system begins to degenerate as people who are competent get replaced by people who are loyal. And eventually, you know, whether you assume Russia will be authoritarian or not, your biggest issue is decision-making in, in a major power like that that basically degenerates. That said, um, I don't think it's necessarily going to make the Russian challenge uh, long-term, much easier. I'll, I'll make two points on this. This is what I think to me is kind of principally the strategic challenge. The first one is that the largest power in Europe, fundamentally outside of NATO, is not a stakeholder in European security. It certainly won't be under Putin, but it's not clear that it's going to be under uh, whoever follows him. Mm. And the second part is we're still fundamentally dealing with the fallout of the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? As many historians have argued that the collapse of the Soviet Union is less an event and much more of a process. These are in many respects still imperial wars. These are fundamentally wars of Soviet succession. And, and the Soviet Union uh, is maybe dead, but it's not gone. It's very much with us. A lot of people, I think, misinterpret the 90s and 2000s because in many cases we avoided all the worst outcomes yeah. of Soviet collapse. But this is actually still those outcomes. This is a follow-on generation of wars that have come increasingly worse. And it's really nice to think that this is sort of the last gasp of a dying empire, but that's not necessarily true. This is, this is not necessarily the last, the last imperial war of Russia. So that's the other point I'll make. And these are two interrelated challenges, right? And the, in general, in conversations about what to do following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, I found, at least from a United States, from a Russian perspective, we focus much more on the question of what to do about security in Europe and how to address the vacuum for security in Europe that both the Soviet Union left and the aspirations of European countries, yeah. and much less on what to do about the fragmentation of the Soviet empire yeah. and how they handle that process. In many ways, either assuming that it was done or hoping that it would be done, but oftentimes having a very fitful engagement with it, right? And very inconsistent in how we were addressing it. Yeah. And that's, that's in part, in small part, but it is in part how, how policy got us in some respects to where we are today. Mm -hmm. Akari? There's actually a Ukrainian saying, Krashi hirsche ta insche. It might be worse, but if it's new, it's still better. <laughs> uh, and what I want to say is I, I agree with, with, with Michael that it much will depend on how it will happen if it, if it happens. If it happens through the popular demand, there will be a chance. If it's a coup, or replacement by Putin with somebody of the same kin. Mm. Uh, difficult to say. And yet, all this being said, I, I always keep going to 53 as well. When a personalist system, the size of the system that we're having now, passes away, mm. it's not very likely that, especially in the country like Russia, that we will get the same kind of extremely personalist system quickly. Mm. It's not impossible, but it will not be there immediately. And that's what will open the window of opportunities for the West, but also for the people inside the country. Very good. Um, we're going to take questions two at a time. So this gentleman here on the table and this gentleman here on this front table. Um, please be respectful to your fellow audience members and keep them nice and short. We don't want to hear lectures. And please introduce yourself. Thank you. Is this on? Um, Perfect. Petter um, Finland's Arctic ambassador. I'm not going to give a lecture. I'll um, make a personal remark. Um, it's, it's a personal remark because I've spent 16 years of my life in Brussels, working on EU-Russia um, relations. I was there for the strategic partnership, for the partnership on modernization. I spent two and a half years uh, negotiating the visa facilitation agreement on visa freedom. I sat through 12 rounds of negotiations for the new comprehensive agreement between EU and Russia. Last five years I spent up to my neck on EU sanctions regimes. In 2019, when I got appointed as the Arctic ambassador, I was thrilled 
that I get back to cooperation side of things, being able to do sort of proactive, positive things. Um, and the cooperation in the Arctic has been remarkably constructive. It was only in it last December when we had the Arctic Council meeting in Russian Siberia, in Salehard. It was a fantastic, excellent meeting. My question is, um, there are some who say that the Arctic might end up as a new theater of conflicts, a region of um, high tensions. Um, and my question is, do you subscribe to that view? Thank you. Thanks. And here, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. William Alberg from IISS. I'm always terrified of the conversation about regime change because I, at, I used to work at NATO and I remember there were certain allies that say, we don't have to reform our militaries because the Putin regime will collapse and then we can go back to business as usual. So I'm a little bit of scared. of. So I was loving the discussion right up till we got to that point. <laughs> um, but my question is, we do have to think about how this ends. I do think this is a forever war for Russia. And therefore, when I think about an end state, whatever that is territorially, it should be NATO membership as the only guarantee to prevent Russia from doing it again. And there is precedent, for instance, with the two plus four treaty of some kind of compromise. And then we can kick the issue of Crimea 20, 30 years down the road like we did with Baltic independence. Do, do you agree or, or am I missing something? That's the only end state I can think of where Russia doesn't do this again. Thank you so much. Okay, who wants to take the Arctic question? I can take it on sure. briefly. So okay, yeah. Okay. Go first. So, so two comments on that. First, I mean, I, I don't see uh, strong political reasons for there to be a conflict in the Arctic that has proximate causes for war in the Arctic. And wars have principally political causes. They don't have accidental causes. It's very common in this field for people to discuss military-to-military -military interactions and discuss it as though military accidents typically lead to war. That's generally not the case. Leaders use force because they feel they must to achieve political aims. They don't because one ship ran into another ship and now they feel they have to go to war. That's not how it happens. The second is, I, I'm going to just politely maybe disagree a bit with ambassadors to say the Arctic is not a new theater of war. It's a very old theater of war, okay? The Arctic has always been a principal theater of military interaction between the United States and Soviet Union. It still is between the United States and Russia. U.S. ships, U.S. submarines, uh, U.S. strategic bomber aircraft cross transpolar routes, and most of our strategic nuclear weapons are uh, weapons that are designed to cross on a transpolar trajectory. The Arctic's not a new theater of war. It has historically been a rather traditional and old theater of war. And if there's going to be a conflict, I don't think it'll be a conflict that originates in the Arctic but you're certainly not going to keep the Arctic out of it as a region. If there's right. a major war between NATO and Russia, you should be very frank about that right from the outset. So it's not a reason to keep some kind of conversation going with Russia vis-a-vis -vis the Arctic. We shouldn't be too afraid of that because I mean, we've been there before. I, I, look, there, I think there's, there's always a reason to have a conversation. It depends on what makes sense politically, right? That's more of a policy question. But I think a lot of folks, and I appreciate a lot of people who work on the Arctic, and, uh, and I work very much with them, mm. uh, want to see the Arctic as something special. And to some extent, I agree with them, but to another extent, I also don't. From a military perspective, the Arctic is, is not nearly that, uh, that distinct, that distinct of, a, of a region on Earth. And historically, it's, that is fundamentally an ahistorical conversation about the role that the Arctic plays in military planning. I just said one sentence that it might be possible to actually insulate some elements of cooperation in the Arctic from the rest, but it will not be possible, even if there is cooperation in the Arctic, to make, it, to make the dynamic so, uh, like, so big so that it would have any impact on the, state of the, on the general state of relations between Russia and the West. Mm -hmm. Kadri and Kadri, um, to William's question, is that the only way you guys see this? Ending? Um, yeah, I won't tackle the Arctic question because my supreme authority on Arctic is none other than Petra himself. <laughs> 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 I won't give your own thoughts back to you. End state. Listen, I do not know. I really do not know. I. Um, <sighs> 
my instinct actually is telling me that when it ends, so it might be in a much more sort of clear-cut situation than, than has been the case for a long time. Mm. I mean, in December, I thought that, yeah, uh, you'd need to <coughs> conclude all sorts of complicated agreements with Russia. We, we, we cannot keep doubling down on what we considered rules-based order, etc. Uh, without being willing to defend it with military force, etc. So I saw the complicated world emerging now. However, and I do not know, but somehow I think that it end differently. It's 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 not where we will end up. Uh, but of course, I mean, we and Michael sort of alluded to that. I think it is important that we um, pay attention to certain realities or, um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that went wrong in the 1990s was exactly Russia signing up to all Western rules and norms that, that it was unable or unwilling to follow later on, you know, that created that trap, legalistic, moral, etc., and um, and made it, made the system very rigid, made it very hard to adapt things because all sorts of adaptations would be seen as sort of moral uh, defeats. So I... I don't think that you know we will get back to the 1990s and Russia joining Western community, having regretted for its sins, and and I don't think we should be wishing for that. I mean, Russia is Russia. Let it be. Let it play the role of Russia, provided it doesn't involve invading other countries. You know, if they manage to learn that lesson, if they manage to disown the war and distance themselves from that, then you know. It's fine that they don't think like us on, on all the matters. It's actually useful for us to have uh, someone out there challenging our views, even if at times it is unpleasant. So I think there should, we should provide some space for that, and that addresses sort of European security issues um, in ways that I think would be good. But... But other than that, where exactly it ends, I, I do not know. But I, yeah, I instinctively, I don't believe in forever war, frankly. I, I, I think Russia runs out of moral strength for that one point. If, if I may just very, very quickly, I think this is a kind of philosophical issue here. And, and Katri very nicely already put it so I just a uh, second for that because we are in a way always seeking for these institutional solutions trying to because it starts from the respect for this rule based order and that's where that where we are and what makes the world in a way mm. be stable and now we are dealing with Russia who who has kind of gone out of that um, scheme totally so we can't find a solution with with this uh, this solution that would be would keep our our institutional world in a way intact so it has to be uh, it has to be different solution this time mm. though we shouldn't beat ourselves up with the fact that russia just disregards all of the promises it's made in the past right effectively just lies about what it says it will do. I mean, that's, not, I that's Russia's problem, not us. Yeah. No, and I don't think... I mean, Russia has been lying a lot as well, and President Putin, you know, special operation is, is his sort of modus operandi. He, he does that. That's his trade. But that said, I don't think that in the early 90s Russia lied when they signed up to all rules and norms. They meant it. I mean, I've been, I've been talking with Russian diplomats who were negotiating Paris Charter as part of Soviet delegation. Mm. They meant all of that, and they had issues with none of this. 
And things just later took a different turn, the domestic tra trajectory, they couldn't arrest it. So it wasn't like they, you know, there is that tendency to, to think that they have dis been deceiving us all along. That is not the case. I think they had best intentions at the time as well, like we did, and it just happened differently. Sorry, I, I have to take these questions, but Mike, you raised eyebrow. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I'd agree, but with two maybe minor nuanced differences, and this is perhaps an arsenal of small differences. The, the two things that were not true, though, I think about the is first, uh, Russia always wanted to have a say over security outcomes in Europe, what they are and how they are determined, mm -hmm. no matter who was leader of Russia. And second, Russia always wanted to have influence in a geopolitical space beyond its borders, okay? And 1990s Russia wanted this too. There are a number of Russian military interventions in the 1990s as well. Use of force to pursue political aims is not something that somehow began under Vladimir Putin. Mm. In 1990s Russia, at the very least, if it didn't want to be the regional hegemon of the former Soviet space, very much wanted to be the arbiter of security outcomes in the former Soviet space, and still wanted to have a lot of it back in terms of political influence and being the country that essentially is the agenda center. Mm. And that hasn't changed. And I'm not sure that's going to change under a different Russian leader. Um, Constance had her hand up for a long time, and um, I think, yes, sorry, I can't see who that is. The light is very bright. There's the arm very high up in the air there, this gentleman here next to the camera. Uh, Constance Stelzenmüller, um, Brookings. Thank you very much for a truly fascinating panel. I think this has been a highlight of the conference. Um, and Kadri's uh, thoughts about Europe having to live with a Russia that is different and that remains a challenge to us, I think opens a whole new set or a whole new panel on what that would mean for European security. But my question to all of you is this. What can we do now and what should we absolutely avoid to try and influence um, endogenous change in Russia that makes us safer after, after Putin? Hi, Ben Tallis, German Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, briefly, to push back against Kadri, I don't think we can let Russia be Russia. We've learned that lesson. Russia has to change. We have to contain, first of all, to prevent exactly the kind of aggressive uh, interventions that Michael has mentioned, but change in the long term. I think Arkady's points, the five, should be required reading for decision makers and experts around Europe. And to come into the point of expertise, which is my question, Michael, you mentioned that the analyst's job is to outline the worst case scenario. I'm not suggesting for a second that we should paint overly optimistic or too rosy pictures, because that's dangerous. But so too is being too gloomy. We know that on the morning of the 24th of February, in capitals around Europe, Ukrainian ambassadors went to their ministries of foreign affairs asking for help. In Berlin, as well as other places, they were told, no, because you're gonna collapse in 48 hours. It's gonna be over, there's no point helping you. What is our responsibility as analysts to, first of all, call it how it is, but also how do we take responsibility for getting it wrong in that way, for overestimating Russia in ways that had pernicious effects on our assistance to Ukraine? Love it, debate. Um, let's go first for Constance. Um, what, what should we do, what can we do to make sure that we're safer after this? Arkady. Uh, we are not yet there to make strategic decisions. I mean, this war will continue before we are able to actually come up with a strategy. Maybe half a year, that's my kind of life horizon, because I think we will know better half a year from now. I think that half a year from now, depending on the number of casualties, people will finally start talking about it inside the country. They're not talking about it inside the country. You just, you, you, it's, it's difficult to imagine. Mm. But up until the mobilization started, this issue was not on the agenda in normal families because it, it wasn't concerning normal families. This was, this was indeed kind of Putin's war. Putin is, is playing games, maybe using contract soldiers, maybe using I don't know whom. It was not an issue because the economic effects were negligible. 
I mean, that, there was some, but fairly negligible for normal. Russians do not care about the inflation. 15% inflation for a normal Russian is, is just nonsense. Mm. It's, it's what has been there for 30 years that prices were growing. So, so where shortage of food would matter, but there's no shortage of food. Shelves are full. Not same type of products, but they're full. So I, I say that six months from now, we will be wiser. But both now and 16, and sorry, six months from now, we should not hurry up with offering too much. We should not hurry up with making too many phone calls to Kremlin. I'm sorry, but when a, pre when a Chancellor X or President Y, I cannot stand the temptation, calls the President Z, it doesn't work because it's read in Kremlin as a readiness to make concessions. Not to explain what's going on as we hear, not to have a discussion, but to make concessions. So I would wait for six months uh, we, and, then, and then start maybe some careful conversations with, 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 with Kremlin. But of course, as for the people, again, I'm sorry, I mean, it's not particularly helpful, but this is, this, I, I cannot suggest anything that would work at the moment. It's too early. Okay. Can you have a response to it? Um, I think, I mean, basically, I, the best we can hope is but Russia will learn from its own mistakes. And I think they have some capacity for that. I mean, they have, they have demonstrated that also, also in the Soviet times. Um, I mean, after Chelyabinsk in 1960s, Soviet regime refrained from shooting its own people on its own territory. Yeltsin broke that taboo, but it was that, and it was a true taboo. Uh, Afghanistan ended badly for them. So, you know, sometimes system can learn from mistake, and this is a mistake of catastrophic magnitude. I would expect them to learn from it once the dust settles and maybe once Putin is gone. And there are people out there who are able to honestly and painfully extract a number of, of lessons. So, I would, I would leave that for them. I think the best thing we can do is do our own thing well. I mean, really make democracy work on our countries so that people see that it works. And, and Russians follow what's happening in the West. I mean, Putin might read us wrong, and he does, but you know, among expert class, there are still people who diligently follow everything that's happening in the West. They call our bluff immediately. They understand when they are preaching but not behaving. But they also notice when we behave the way we preach. And that, that for them will create facts on the ground. They will understand that Western liberal democracy is a fact of life and that to stay. And that will shape their calculations for, for Russia as well. So that I think essentially is the best way we can, we can influence Russia's reasoning. Phone calls, you know, these are, I think they are useless, but they are also pretty harmless, actually. I don't think that, that this really encourages Putin in, in anything. He, he's, he's beyond, beyond that. Mm. Yeah, may, may, thank you. I may, could continue like, exactly from there. So <clears throat> while Russia is doing the thinking and maybe, maybe learning, hopefully, I think uh, our, our focus should be on Ukraine. So uh, exactly like Kadri, Kadri said, to in a way uh, help or to uh, help uh, Ukraine to be successful, and then that might have in an indirect way a, a bigger effect to than anything uh, we we could do directly with any any opposition left in mm. in Russia. Mike, you're left with why were we so down on Ukraine's chances, and do we need to own up to that as a Western analyst community? Sure, that's a good question. Well, first of all, it depends on who we are, because the analyst community always has debates and different points of view on it. It's not sure. like there's one consensus. Second, it's a question of who you're actually asking, analysts who do a lot of public work like me do, or the intelligence community. I see a lot of complaints 
about intelligence estimates from people who I know have never read them and never seen them in their <laughs> life, okay? It's 99.999% of people I hear talk about what an intelligence estimate got wrong. I'm highly confident they've never seen it, okay? And they don't know what it says, okay? So that being said, first, there's few things as contingent as war. I know I use that a lot. I think the Alco community predicted the war fairly successfully, at least a lot of people in it, on the military analyst side. Not the political analyst, Kadri, the military analyst. Sure. Um, but got the scope of the Russian operation, Russian force employment, and, and the outcome wrong, at least in the conventional phase of the war. I think the assumption going into it was, it varied between people. For folks like me, it was that it would be a difficult fight, but that Ukraine probably was going to lose the conventional phase of the war, but that Russia was not likely to win the stabilization or occupation phase. All right, so here's the truth. Analysts usually speak to policymakers with a lot of nuance, with uncertainty and contingency. Then when you see here policymakers say what they think they heard, all that nuance and contingency is completely gone, okay? And that's policymakers that you hear say that they thought Ukraine might lose or that Kiev could be taken in three days. And if you ask them if anybody actually said that to them specifically on paper, good luck, good luck seeing them come up with that. And then journalists quote them and it's one quote. And then yeah. And then, so, yeah, so no offense. Um, yeah, the job isn't as easy as it looks. In DC, we have a joke that things are either a policy success or an intelligence failure, okay? <laughs> ben, your comment to me is fascinating because I think in many cases we have a policy success, but we still have a, a, a section of the community complaining about an intelligence failure as well, despite the overall success of the policy. So a couple points on this. First, yes, some countries, some policymakers, and some analysts were quite gloomy, okay? Second, in fairness, many Ukrainians and Ukrainian colleagues were very gloomy too, both in the run-up to the war and also in the early days, okay? It's only after the fact that the narrative emerged that of course Ukraine was always going to do much better and do well and all that. Cool. If we replay the footage from the first couple of days, you'll find something that's important to understand. This outcome was not overdetermined. The more we know about the early period of the war, the clearer it is how close of a th run thing this really was. Absolutely. And it hinged a lot on agency, on decisions by people like Zelensky, on a lot of factors, it could have potentially gone the other way, and so you shouldn't be overly comforted by the outcome, either in the initial period of war, or actually later on in the war. Without Western and United States assistance, you can see the war of attrition taking a very different trajectory after May, okay? So, that said, I think in many respects, the issue was much less that we overestimated the Russian military, which to an extent is true, but it's a pretty glib and not very smart debate in the community, but much more that we underestimated the Ukrainian military, okay? And it wasn't so much Ukrainian will to fight, I've also heard that. Generally, I hear these things from people, I'll be very honest, that I've never seen in the room in a single discussion <laughs> on the Russian military or on the Ukrainian military or in the run-up to the war. So I want to be frank, you know, if you weren't there, uh, have some intellectual humility about talking about what people thought, why they thought it, and what the debate was. So, to conclude this commentary, yeah, from the alcohol community, analysts get things wrong. The important part from this is to learn from it and to move on, okay? It's still better up, much better off than the pop-up Twitter experts. <laughs> Yeah. Just a great comment. Uh, yeah. Now, I just, to reinforce what Michael said, I, I'm sort of taking a general issue with the idea that analysis is, uh, is equated with predictions or forecasts. I mean, for predictions, go to astrologists. That's, uh, that's that trait. Uh, analysts work with trends. We work with what, what do we know about how other actors think of our goals and means. Uh, and I, I speak that as someone who didn't predict the war because I didn't see it growing out from political discussion in Russia. I mean, we had that debate in one of the podcasts with Michael. Michael said that, uh, that what he sees on the ground suggests that there will be a war. I said what I see in discussions in Moscow suggests no. Uh, because Russia had its aims, but uh, non-military means were there to achieve them, and that seemed to be the consensus in the wider establishment. And war seemed a disaster, which it is. I mean, I, I went through a list of things that Russia is losing or, or risking, so I'm not even ashamed of not predicting it. I didn't think that Russia will engage in a suicidal exercise and... And I'm not ashamed of it. I, I, I think I, 
I got Russia basically right. I, I might have failed as Putin's psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's that's somewhat of a different thing. And you know, things just happen as uh, life always has its unpredictable ways. And I I don't think we should even aspire to predict everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's somehow even arrogant. Not not everything is determined by 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 these rational factors that you can foresee. I mean, life is not a computer program, and it has no right uh, not to be. It's good it's not. Uh, life has space for miracles as well. So that's how it is. And just in defense of both pessimism in the early days and mm -hmm. phone calls, we have all seen the video of Zelensky telling Macron, you've got to get on the phone to Putin and uh, tell him to call this off. Of course, now we know that would have been a waste of time. Um, Andrew here, I'll just hand up. And there's a question here, uh, the lady in the uh, grey uh, pullover. Thanks, Andrew Mick to the Marshall Center. Uh, a comment to Arkady and then uh, to Michael, if I may. Um, I fully concur and agree with you that this is a war between the West and Russia. But I would submit to you that while a lot of military leaders understand that, analysts, think tankers, I think there are large segments of the policymaking community that are still in what I uh, called recently a crisis of disbelief. Uh, that, uh, and, and that process is what I think ties to Michael's comments, because you know, in, in sessions like this, we, we like to poke fun at uh, munition stocks and the inability to deploy and all this kind of stuff. Well, we're months into this war and large segments of the European uh, economy are not converted mm -hmm. to wartime production. We're not building up stocks that we need. Uh, so yeah, we can build these wonderful uh, you know, stories about how many French howitzers were sent in and what a joke it is. My question is this, what do we need to do? And I'm, I'm speaking to us here, people who are, who are working on these issues professionally, to take that conversation to a point where we not only have political statements of unity, because we do, across the alliance. But we have a very different level of appetite for risk taking as you travel away from the flank. Now in Finland, it's absolutely clear what the nature of the threat is. I hear the same in Warsaw, in, in Tallinn and, and other places. As I travel west, things begin to change in the conversation. And, and Michael, I think until we get to that point where there is this sense of political consensus that this is about us, this is not about them, Right? You will not have the kind of commitment to stand up factories, shorten lead times on munition productions, build enough barrels, and on and on and on, and actually take a look at the consumption of munitions and adjust our own programs accordingly. So I, am, I just offer a word of caution here as to where this war is going. I agree with you. The predictions on the initial, the predictions now, we tend to seesaw back and forth, you know. Langsam. Let's, let's understand that this is something very fundamental and until we have a political decision to back it up with actual money, factories, production, we're going to be having these conversations amongst ourselves, but we will not have political decision makers get there. So how do we get to that point? Thanks, Andrew. And just very quickly, this lady here. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Rachel Tosenfront. I'm with uh, FIA as a visiting scholar. I have a question. I'm not asking you to predict, but um, I am asking you if it's possible. So it, this it's related to the, is there a way that with Putin in charge, this war could end, right? Because it seems like he's completely doubled down with the mobilization and now the sham referendum. And it seems very difficult to imagine a scenario where he could end this war that he created, as opposed to someone else saying, you know, that was his mistake and now I can end it. But then I think, you know, I think about Trump in the Trump media world. And Arkady said in the average Russian family until two days ago, no one was talking about the war. I mean, we forget that people can live in a completely different yeah. reality. And so, you know, Trump changed like one line in NAFTA and told his people, I completely, you know, made a completely new trade deal that's great for us. And everyone's like, yes, he did. And then he, you know, made the Muslim ban that got turned around, but he was able to convince his people that he had, you know, completely saved America from the Muslim invasion, whatever. Uh, it wasn't until COVID, because that was a crisis on the street that you couldn't sort of hide. Um, if something happened, I mean, we should be so happy that Putin would decide 
okay, really, you know, this is going to kill me if I continue with it. I have to end it. Could he spin it? I mean, could he spin a loss, like maybe they keep Crimea and they lose the rest, but the state media, you know, makes up a story mm. that retains his power, that retains his ability to like spin the narrative of being the victor, even in defeat, would that be possible? Yeah. Okay, so first question, how do we break the crisis of disbelief amongst policymakers, certain policymakers? Well, I, I mean, I know, I'm not sure I can answer the question how, but in fact, I'm with you because I had a comment published in, in, in the end of August where I said exactly that, that a number of European politicians uh, have a problem because they cannot say to themselves that the change in relations with Russia is irreversible. And because they cannot say it to themselves, uh, they cannot communicate it to the public. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, and the, they, they should. And uh, kind of one, once they've done that, things might start moving in the right direction. And to add to that, they, they need to say to themselves one more thing that more generally, regardless of the state of affairs and the Western Russian relations, the postmodern period in the history of Europe is over. The period when kind of security considerations were not necessarily neglected, but they were kind of secondary to the economic considerations. We were absolutizing the growth. We were absolutizing the savings, which we were not making, but of, and of course the military was supposed to be, yeah. So we ended up depending on Russia, on energy, on Turkey, on border protection, on China, on deliveries of most industrial goods. I mean, it didn't happen by accident. It happened because we were following a certain ideology of postmodernism, that wars will never be happening again, that uh, the countries we will be dealing with will be just happy uh, to deal with us economically, and that kind of economic interdependence will buy us peace and security and prosperity. So that spirit is finally over, and that window of opportunity that we're having now should be used also to first explain it to our politicians, then they will have, hopefully explain it to the others. Not sure I know how, but at least I know that this is indeed the problem. On Putin, until two days ago, he had a chance. He could have made that speech saying, mission accomplished. Yeah. Not that anybody would necessarily believe him. By the way, the Russian journalists, not somebody else, but well, abroad, actually reread the Crimea speech, where he says exactly that. I mean, there will be no more new annexations. Mm. And now he repeats it, there will be no more new annexations. But he had a chance. Had he said it, uh, the Russian media would have created a story and so on. But now uh, he missed that opportunity. So for, as long, so for as long as he's in charge, it's going to be very difficult. Still probably not impossible, but much more difficult. Uh, but again, we'll see how the things will develop in the following several months. My boss is this big clock here, which you guys can see is running out of time very quickly. So very quickly, in response to all those questions. Anyone? Does anyone disagree with Arkady? Have, 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 has the crisis of disbelief been broken in some places? To racially, I, I was thinking I, I could give it 5%. <laughs> I, I think it is uh, unlikely, but not completely excluded. I mean, Putin has earlier shown ability to accept um, defeat or need to pause and retreat. Also in Ukraine, he was forced to accept the outcome of foreign, uh, Orange Revolution. He, he saw that uprising in eastern Ukraine in 2014 wasn't going as needed. He, he strength, changed strategy. So he has done those sorts of things earlier. And, and yeah, Russian media, of course, has duly spinned everything as, as victory. But, um, but now he has staked so much. And it's really existential. Before that war, I thought that Putin is, will outlast Putin and that will be the shaper of system for years and decades to come potentially. Now I don't think so. I, I, I think Putin is the end of, of, of Putinism, as we, as we know it at least. There might be features, but not. And, um, and it's also harder for him 
I mean, earlier I thought that he can leave power and, and live as elderly statesman, honored in Russia, despised everywhere else, but who cares? Now I, I don't see that future for him either. So, yeah. But 5%. <laughs> No, that was ex excellently put. I, I don't have anything to add. That was excellent. Mike? Yeah, to the question, you know, could, could somehow the war end under Putin? The answer is yes, Russia could lose the war. Big powers lose wars all the time, actually, in history. Yeah, Russia could lose the war. So yes, it can potentially end. May I end in something that people like to think of as 100% peace, right? Like the complete and total end of conflict. But yes, Russia can very, very much lose the war. It's actually currently on that distinct trajectory. Although we should be careful with straight line analysis, right? People often assume that whatever phase of the war you're in is how the war is going to continue. But nonetheless, Russia is currently losing this war. And on that note, uh, the red thing is flashing. We have to finish. Um, Thank you all so much for coming to listen. Thank you to this amazing panel. You're an absolute dream as a moderator. Um, to Mike, Kadri, Arkady, and Kadri, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Um, please go get a coffee and stick around for the final session. And um, yeah, have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>